Hello and welcome back to OT the podcast. We're here to talk about watches, time, how to spend it. I'm Andy Green. Me, Felix Schultz, also here. Welcome back, Felix. What's going on? Uh, you know, we've got a great guest today. Calling in from somewhere a little bit sunnier than where we are. Doing a bit of an uh, LA focus recently. We've got uh, Aaron Bazakanian from uh, independent newcomer, Harvid Nagan. Uh, mm. uh, he, he comes on. We've got some other guests coming from LA lined up as well. So exclusively uh, Los Angeles time. Great time zone for us, to be honest. It's a really good time zone for for Melbourne. Yeah, it's like their midday, our our morning. It works out well. Sneaking into a lunch lunch yeah. break, you know, just works out well. What has been going on in your life, Andy? Grrr. I've been watching uh, watching something on Netflix, which a little bit disappointing. Fifty six percent of Google users like this show, which is. I think uh, I think it's harsh. Okay, uh, it's just popped up in my feed. It's called okay. Snack vs Chef. <sighs> okay, prize pool. You messaged this to me. Yes, I did. I did. They're chefs, they're food scientists, and they go to head to head, kind of recreating iconic snacks. Oh, so there's no amateurs. Yeah, they're, well, they're pretty amateur. So they they do like things like making like Oreos or Pringles, and they have to do it in the kitchen from scratch which is quite educational because you learn about all the different um, science that goes into the, to the food and it, you know, it's not that easy. Uh, the total prize is 50 grand. So that tells you the budget uh, that, that they're sort of working with. Sure. So, um, it's, so- it's, I reckon they probably spent a million dollars at most on the whole thing, eight episodes. There's oddly um, two hosts and two judges that don't do either job. So it's quite a crowded. Classic. Um, classic. Quite, quite a crowded. Uh, Set. Yeah, set. But what I love is so they, they have to prepare it and the way they've edited it up is just it's just wonderful. So, you know, they'll be making the Oreos and they're all talking about it. There's these lovely cut scenes of them doing it and working really hard. And you actually believe that they're going to deliver something like an Oreo. And then they just don't. They just – I mean, it's still impressive and it's better than I could do, but it's just so underwhelming every time. And then you kind of go, yeah, well, they had two hours to make an Oreo. What do you expect? But So, so when you sent this to me, I asked if Claire Saffitz was involved. Mm-hmm. Do you know who Claire Saffitz is? Uh, isn't she like a food journalist or something? So she's a food journalist. She was a Bon Appetit and before uh-huh. they all imploded just before COVID. And she had a segment that sounds incredibly like this. So she's, I think, more on, you know, sort of food science-y. Where she, they would give her a job and they'd say, you have to recreate, you know, Starburst. It's probably where they nicked it from, to yeah, be honest. Exactly. But it, it's... It- <laughs> Let's do, let's do both. Watch this and then go and watch. I'll recommend it to you, Andy, as well. Go watch the old Claire Havertz videos and you'll be you'll see what it could have possibly been. I love it. I love it. I know you've been watching something as well, but we should probably talk about our favourite strap company, Howling from Australia, Adam Straps. Adam Straps. I mean, it's Christmas coming it's up. Christmas. Andy. Probably can get a strap in time. Express you order it now. Well, don't. Just, you know, you don't have, you've got your phone in front of you. Switch mm-hmm. away from your podcast app. Go to Artem.straps on Instagram. There's probably a button that you can click through to Artemstraps.com. Mm. Buy a strap. You don't, you don't have to worry about the lug width. Just get Just one of yourself. Each. Just get some. Just yeah. get some Artemstraps. If you've got anyone in your life that is also a watch fiend, get them a strap. Yep. Yep. Just get them five. Support Artemstraps. I'm famously hard to buy for. And if anyone in my family is listening, actually they probably are listening, so <laughs> this is only for the bit of the ad read. This is a, for anyone in my hypothetical family is listening, mm. Artem Straps, NATO Straps. You can't go, I, I won't be unhappy with it. Maybe this will be the one episode your partner listens to. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, speaking of uh, awkward family tension, Ooh. Uh, White Lotus. Yes, very good season two. You've been watching it, have you? Oh, mate. It's, um, I, I know you haven't watched it. I'm one episode in. Yeah, which is a very smart play because I kind of didn't realise that it was a week to weeker until I ran out and was very, very frustrated. Mm. So mm. I think we're getting towards the pointy end. It's very, very good. It's very beautiful. Do you know what I've realised? What's that? Uh, I believe everyone's favourite uh, watch brand, Jacob & Co, who recently hosted the creme de la creme of uh, watch media. They hosted them at the Bloody Hotel from White Lotus. Huh. Kind of feels like burying the lead. I mean, Godfather's great, sure. You know, Jake mm. and Co. They make watches. That's great. White Lotus Hotel. I would have just been walking around, going, oh, da, 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 you know, pretending to be Jennifer Coolidge. So um, apparently, there's a lot of um, the direct. I don't know who the director is, but there's a lot of uh, like film, classic film throwbacks. Of the way it. they've shot it. Yes, excellent. Um, like a lot of really on point references. 
Do you want to know something else about the director? Sure. Survivor contestant. Which season? I don't know. But there's, there's a couple of cameos like an early on, probably in the first episode actually, that the people on the beach that just arrived, they were also Survivor contestants. Yeah. I just there thought you that go. Was- so wait till White Lotus season two fully kind of drops and then watch it and just try your best to avoid spoilers. Yeah. It's a new episode. I'm, you know, going to watch it in like an hour. So we better wrap this up. <laughs> well, without further ado, Felix, what are we doing now? Let's get Aaron on the line. All right, let's do it. Andy, we've been looking at some watches recently uh, because it's hard to miss them. They've got a really distinctive case silhouette and stunning dials. Uh, So we thought we would find out who made them. And what do you know? He's now on the call with us. Honoured to welcome Aaron Bazakanian from LA-based independent brand Harvin Nagan to OT. Welcome, Aaron. How are you? Thank you for having me, gentlemen. I'm doing. I'm doing well. It's 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 just about December, and uh, and it's about I think seventy degrees today. So it's it's always good to be here. Well, it's December here, um, so we are a little bit ahead of you. Now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it is it is nice to chat to you. Obviously, you've you're in LA. We want to talk to you about your background and um, you know how you've ended up a young entrepreneur in the watch space. Mm-hmm. And I think you're only about 30, 31, so same age as, as me. Do you come from a long line of watchmakers? No, not at all. So uh, contrary to, I guess, what the typical story is of what you hear as far as the Swiss industry or Swiss watch industry, I should say, um, I have no connection whatsoever uh, to you know my family being in watchmaking or coming from a jewelry background or anything like that. So um, no, this was me just going into it out of pure passion and uh, want to to sort of express myself in a watchmaking context. So um, no, no sort of connection, uh, you know, to the industry at all, other than the fact that, you know, I fell in love with it and realized this was what I wanted to commit my life to. I think we'll, um, we'll, we'll obviously get into the story of, of that first, like your brand first, but you, when did you fall in love with watches? And was there a particular sort of uh you know watch or moment that you're like yes this is a thing that i'm into yes so so i i I would be lying if i said i knew exactly the second you know i fell in love but it was it was about uh i would say i was about 18 19 years old where i started sort of paying attention just generally you know rolex and uh patek and um i had no idea what the independent watch scene was at all i didn't even know it existed um So I started really kind of paying attention to, you know, what Rolex was doing and, you know, just very vague. Uh, And then I realized, oh, man, there's even better than Rolex. And I realized Patek uh, was a company. And I was like, man, like these are, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollar watches, if not more. And uh, I was like, wait a minute, this is this is pretty interesting. Why would anyone pay fifty, sixty thousand dollars? And then um, so I learned about the traditional side at a very Mm -hmm. vague level. from those two companies and specifically what made me go way deeper into, you know, the nuanced brands and the more niche brands was uh, I was headed to the gym. I remember today um, headed to the gym to Pasadena, California. Um, and I was kind of pumping myself up with, you know, upbeat music. And um, I heard the name Frank Mueller mentioned mm-hmm. in, in a song um, and it kept coming up and I was like, man, what, what's Frank Mueller? Cause they said, it said uh, Frank Mueller on the wrist or something like that. And um, so I Googled it and I saw the first watch I saw come up was a Casablanca Havana. Okay. And I saw the case shape. I saw the numerals. I saw everyone's like, man, like that's cool. You know, cause you, you're, when you first think watch in your head, you think round Rolex comes to mind. Um, and I had the context of Patek Philippe. So, you know, that's what would, come populate into my mind when I thought about watches and then I saw the Frank Mueller with the tonneau case and the crazy numerals and the complications and I was like man like that that's a watch I want like that is something it made my heart uh sort of murmur so um that was really the the exact point of going deeper into the independent side and going down the rabbit hole so to speak so um the atypical I guess design uh, within the watchmaking context is what really drew me and continues to draw me uh, today. 
No, I was going to say, so I think your background is re- uh, real estate, obviously. You know, the, the watch brand is about a year old or a year and a half old now. And I was just curious, sort of, I know that it's been in the works for a long time before you officially launched it. Right. And there's a lot to, to, you know, have a chat about the detail side of things. But what are your hard skills, like, when it comes to watch making or watch design? Are you a designer? Do you know anything about, you know, actually making watches? Like, how did you find yourself with a watch brand? Uh, sure. So, so you know, on the real estate side, so uh, that was my previous career. Uh, mm-hmm. I've... I, uh, since let go of it, I don't, I'm not connected to it whatsoever at this point, other than, you know, my father is still involved in, and that's his, uh, you know, that's his job. Um, but as far as the real estate context is concerned, the design orientation of art, like the deep architecture and LA architecture, the modern homes and the white facades is where I sort of picked up, um, I guess the eye for design, if you want to call it that, um, and um, in terms of the watchmaking skills, I mean, I'm not a watchmaker. I, mm-hmm. I'm not. Uh, I'm not technically uh, talented in that regard. And I've tried my hand at sort of, uh, you know, taking apart movements and putting them back together. And I am currently working on, um, uh, uh, so far unsuccessfully, but uh, taking apart a old uh, pocket watch and putting it back together. But it's proving challenging. Uh, so as far as um, the watchmaking side, I do not, uh, you know, I'm not a watchmaker. I do not uh, mm-hmm. try to uh, paint myself as such. And um, as far as my own skills, I design the watches that I put out mm-hmm. and uh, produce. So I draw them out. I draw out the complications and the dials. Um, I understand at a, I think, above base level understanding of, of uh gear train layouts and architecture of the movements themselves and sure. logically why things are uh, moving the way they are and why they are placed where they are. So um, really being behind the scenes and developing uh, the watches really illuminates much more on, uh, you know, why things are put where they are and, uh, you know, gear profiles and, uh, you know, how, how complications will align with one another on, on the same plane in a, in a movement. So um, that's, that's my real expertise is the design, I would say. And, um, that's, that's what uh, I read the books of, you know, George Daniels, you know, watchmaking and the brigade books and art of brigade. And, you know, I try to understand it as much as I can, because that's my fascination with it, but, sure. uh, that's, that's the limit of it. That's it. I think this is a good time to actually talk about, you know, so that's sort of the, the broad context around, around uh, you and, you know, where, where your love of watches came. But I think what will have sort of it drew us in certainly is, is the watch itself. Your, your debut watch is the HN000, I'm going to say. I could say 000. 000, um, I think. Uh, it's built around the idea of a paradox, apparently. What, what what does that mean, and how does that translate in a, <laughs> into a, a, a real object? Sure, sure. So the paradox uh, idea that I had was sort of, um, you know, two of these um, modalities of, I suppose you can call it design or physical fit or however you want to, uh, you whatever eye you want to take it uh, from, is um, if you look at the case, obviously it's very modern, it's contemporary, it's geometric, it's, um, it's a sporty watch. Uh, there is no, uh, there's no two ways of putting it, you know, as far as the fit on the wrist and what it looks like and the material being used being grade five titanium. So that's the modern modality of it. And the, the traditional aspect is, you know, for example, on the first one, the art of Guilleche, that's what the OO series will always be centered around. Um, so it was the combination of these two, conflicting and you know sort of paradoxical ideas that um you know technically aren't supposed to be working together but to me i wanted to combine these two modalities so that's the sort of loose uh application of the term paradox to it um now obviously there's marketing involved and you know having this sort of uh, uh motto attached to the brand in a way um and that's that's basically what i wanted to uh put across to the consumer was, you know, the complications and, and this idea will be um, expounded upon further with each model release. So with this one, it's uh, the entry of that or the introduction of that idea. And you'll see where I'm headed with this more and more with the release of the second one with a, um, the case design, for example, in the case shape will always 
be the same more or less uh, because that's the identity of the brand. But sure. uh, the dial layouts are what will uh, really push that paradoxical idea because uh, they'll be off-centered. They'll resemble a lot of uh, what Breguet used to do and uh, a lot of these uh, great watchmakers from the past, how you know they had the freedom of putting place uh, placing uh, complications seemingly wherever they wanted on the dial to be completely honest um and that traditional layout of the greats and what they did uh combined with the modern sporty uh you know case and the fit of the watch you've you've spoken about the case a bit and it's really um it's really interesting it's not uh you know an off the shelf case obviously uh and from the top down it sort of looks you know it's got that sporty sort of vaguely tonneau-ish uh, feel to it that, you know, is very fitting for a, a sports watch. But for right. me, uh, it, it all sort of came together when I looked at it from the side. That's cool. It's got a real, right. like, to me, it's like that sort of Art Deco uh, aesthetic inspiration. Wh- is Where did that come from? That interesting part. Oh, um, I'm glad you brought up the Art Deco thing because, uh, yes, there, there's definitely inspiration from Art Deco and especially the... As far as a watch context or a watch making context, a lot of the uh, neo vintage stuff that, for example, Zenith was doing, what Patek used to do uh, with interesting case design and very just different and nuanced case designs that I personally love. Uh, if you look at, for example, the old uh, traditional uh, case stylings of, of uh, the Audemars Piguet brand, and uh, the John Schaefer cases, I don't know if you guys are familiar with those, but um, these beautiful things that nobody is really doing anymore. And maybe it's a, um, I suppose you can say more of a, it's such an avant-garde or such a nuanced thing that maybe it just doesn't fit in line with their production lines or production timelines. Um, but I fell in love with that stuff. I fell in love with the case structures that were so different and they themselves were thought provoking and sort of a conversation. Uh, piece themselves forget the dial forget the movement I mean the case alone was something to talk about so I wanted to bring that back now in terms of uh, the shape itself obviously it has a sporty look and it's got sort of a tonal sort of a cushion case kind of uh, styling to it but in a non-watchmaking context uh, my real inspiration for the case design was uh, like I said uh, uh, Los Angeles real estate and I know that's kind of you know, how can you take real, real estate uh, and, and bring that into a watch? But if you look at the work of, um, uh, in particular, a, an a astounding uh, architect that I came across in my time at real estate was um, uh, Paul McQueen. So this, this guy, this architect basically took what you think of when you think modern, you know, Hollywood Hills real estate, white facades and sure. just these blocks you know white blocks of, of building um he took it and basically like just injected nuance into them and he had these curvatures inside uh, especially inside of the home um and the materials that he used and the glass that he used uh just sort of it was sort of like peering through the home uh when you're standing in front of the uh, the front entry and i was like man like this is i fell in love with that idea of okay here is something familiar but we're going to add nuance to it and we're going to add, uh, you know, different lines and structures and, and just uh, uh, corners and geometry to it. So I sort of took that as an inspiration point of, OK, I like sporty watches. That's just how I am. Uh, I love the fit of them. I love the casualness of them. But how can I expound upon it? How can I make it my own? How can I um uh, change it in my own way that I would, you know, look at the thing on my wrist and be like, wow, like even the case alone is something to look at. So, you know, the geometry that you see on the case um, from that, from each side of it, of course, top down from the side, uh, there's the, all of these lines going and there's a lot of geometry in it. And um, I wanted it to be sort of this conversation piece itself. I wanted someone to, you know, walk by and say, Hey, what is that? Uh, sure. And I obviously as, as a brand, I want, um, the entire design of the watch itself to be identifiable. Uh, to me, that's, you know, for example, if you look at Richard Mill, uh, you know, despite all, you know, whatever someone might think about the brand, mm-hmm. um, if you look at someone and you know what, the, you know, the, the existence of the brand, then you know exactly what a Richard Mill is on someone's wrist. So 
Um, same thing applies, I guess, for a Jorn. FP Jorn's a design, dial designs, you know, you know exactly when you're looking at an FP Jorn. So I took that as I need to set a, um, a design parameter that will always be consistent throughout the existence of the brand. And that's, you know, one pillar of that is the case design. So that's where all of it sort of comes together. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. And so you've, uh, you dropped your first model, which Felix has already mentioned. Um, it's quite interesting. You got a lot of press on it, which is pretty impressive for someone coming out the gate, you know, and just a brand new brand. And it's sort of interesting to sort of see the comments and see what people say, uh, right. about that debut, but obviously you sold out the first run, uh, were they 8,000 us? Do you, do you talk about how many, the, the, that you made the first run and what the plans for the second run are? Oh yeah, more more than happy. Uh, so yes, so we I officially launched the brand. It's it's been in the works, I guess you can say, from that point about uh, about a year and three quarters, maybe two years if you want to round up. Um, so I launched it in April. We ran a subscription for two months, um, just because. And I'm happy to talk about this. Is sure. you know, as a young startup, uh, I funded everything myself, um, and we uh, sold 115. Cool. In that Very timeline. Good. So that's the first first batch. Um, there will not be a second batch of this exact model, uh, the reference, I guess you want to say. Yep. Um, so there is that distinction between HNOO and HNOOO. Uh, and I'm happy to, to clear the thing, the, the, that little issue up is the HNOO is the, uh, the model itself. Now, okay. if, if you want to be technical, this is the first iteration Okay. of the OO. So there will be a second iteration eventually that will take on the design language that the second model will set. Uh -huh. um, so uh, there won't technically be a second batch of this one exactly, but there will be another OO. I guess you can call it the OO-01. Um, and, and have you uh, delivered these? These are the 115? Uh, so no. So they, they will be delivered in, uh, at the end of February. Okay. Uh, the straps are... Uh, due today so they're going to be coming uh shortly to uh, to my house and uh the boxes are in so things are starting to come in it's just it's a uh it's sort of an interesting situation what's happening with all the supply chain delays and uh -huh. you know, all that stuff so so uh, see so two months you did about a million dollars in your, you know, your very your first year what does that yeah. what does that do to a new brand like how do you how do you sort of take that early success out the gates and direct it in the right way like what do you we have plan. Uh, um, so a lot of people, especially my family, like, oh, my God, you should be so proud. I can't believe you did this and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I yes, I am proud and I'm happy that it went the way it is um, going. But I don't look at it as, oh, man, you know, now I can, uh, you know, hang out and, and relax. Like that is not what is going through my mind at all. I'm looking at it as, okay. You know, whatever universal power smiled upon me uh, in this first round and has given me the chance to really deliver something uh, special on the second one. And I'm not saying this isn't special at all. It's just um, I want to always do something better. I want to make it more complicated and uh, better finished. And, you know, um, so I want to, I guess, if you want to distill the goal of what I will do in the next coming months is really focus uh, on uh, one delivery of the first one, of course, and, and making sure everyone's happy with, with the watch and whatnot, uh, but really execute properly on the second one, because that's going to be the watch that will, I'm not saying set me apart or anything like that. I mean, um, it will be the one that really catches the attention of people uh, that might have missed on this first one or, um, or, uh, you know, they, they sort of viewed the, the first one as, ah, it's a little too simple. I'm dealing with, you know, debitoons and Google Forzies and all that stuff. And I need something that's a little more um, complicated or more nuanced. So um, this initial watch was meant to be sort of the everyday or sort of the entry to the brand and uh, introduce the design of the case, uh, the what the brand will look like as far as a physical uh, you know thing is concerned and the second watch will be the one that uh, will introduce the going forward design language of what you will see and what you will uh, associate with uh, the hubby nagam brand exciting um so you, you we've sort of already talked a bit about how you have you know worked with 
with uh, other suppliers to to put this all together, um, including Shvat Etienne for the movement, which is which is a really great sort of um, e borshas that, that, that they develop. How have you found um, that that dealing with multiple? I'm going to say a fair few Swiss suppliers and you know getting them all to talk to each other and work together. Uh, how's that experience been? Um, it's it's sort of like a glorified project manager role. Um, now, the good thing is in real estate, it's sort of the same dynamic. You're the, the middleman between escrow companies and mortgage companies and lenders and uh, you know the, the buyer and the seller and the different agents involved and all that stuff. So you're kind of coordinating and orchestrating the entire thing from, from A to Z. The same mm. sort of dynamic applies when you're the one that is running the company, for example, in LA and uh, you know, the different suppliers and the manufacturers are in Switzerland, um, you're, you know, uh, whatever information is coming in from one side, you are communicating to the other side. Uh, so for example, when Schwartz Etienne says, uh, hey, Aaron, uh, you know, the cases are all done. Uh, movements, movements looking good too. Uh, how's the, how's it going with the dials? I communicate that same information to Kadranor, who is the dial maker that I work with, and uh, vice versa. So it's it's a project management uh, dynamic. It really is. So um, I went and met with um, both Kadranor and uh, Schwartz Etienne in the in this last summer, and outstanding people all all around. They are very very kind first and foremost and good human beings uh that's how i like to judge character uh first and foremost is to know and respect the people that i am working with and and see that it is a mutual feeling and uh, they treated me and my family like family um mm-hmm. and and i hope they feel the same way and um it was sort of a uh, just emailing back and forth and having some uh you know zoom calls and being very very concise with the information that i am giving them and being very concise in understanding the information they are giving me. Mm. So uh, it's really that. It's, it's um, just making sure that, uh, you know, if they send a message, for example, and I have a doubt with what they mean or what they are saying, I will call them and say, okay, I just want to make sure this is what you are saying. This is what is mm-hmm. going to be yeah. delivered. This is when, you know, it's just making sure all of the fine details are laid out and understood between everyone. So um, it's really that. And then as far as connecting with them in the first place, I mean, Schwartz Etienne was more of a, uh, you know, standard. I emailed them and said, Hey, I have this idea. This is the watch that I want to design. I love your movements. They are phenomenal, uh, you know, over coil hairsprings yeah. and they're manufacturing their own hairsprings and, and balance wheels. So it was immediately, you know, Oh my God, I need to, these, these are my people. I need to be with them. Um, so I'm lucky to have, uh, you know, been in their good grace and still am, um, I can, you know, I'm more than happy to tell people and, uh, you know, go into detail about, uh, what the second development will be like, cause it will be a little different. Um, but as far as the dynamic of connecting with one another and, 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 uh, communicating between uh, the development of the project, that's more or less how it is. A quick question. Um, so this has been, you know, in the works for a few years of, I'm assuming, sort of pretty active planning and and all that sort of actual work. Mm-hmm. What is something uh, that Aaron knows now that you would have changed back then? Or like, would you tell yourself, hey, just don't mess around with this, go straight to that? Is there any sort of big um, for you? Yes, definitely. I'm, I'm, that's a very good question, actually. Um, timelines. Uh, definitely timelines. That would <laughs> yeah. be my number one uh, lesson. I guess I would tell myself, you know, looking back, um, who would have known to be completely honest, because I did not have those or the same issues I'm having now as I was going to have back then, uh, because the industry hadn't turned into the madness that we see now. So I can tell you, for example, um, one, the, the OOs were supposed to be delivered in December. Yeah. That was the original timeline. Um, now, I, we got pushed back to end of February, which, you know, at the end of the day, is that a huge wait further? No, because everyone's so used to, you know, years, especially with, you know, different brands and um, which, you know, to me, that's not the preferred way of, of, you know, taking delivery of watches. But that is the unfortunate reality that we are all in. Um, 
But I can tell you, for example, in the development of uh, the O1, Lucene, that I have been talking about uh, recently, uh, that's the second watch, um, the timelines are pretty crazy. Um, we had to do a little bit of finessing and trying to uh, work around some details to make sure the prototypes could be delivered uh, sooner because the original timeline was about 14 to 16 months where the sure. the prototypes themselves would be delivered, wow. which is just madness. Um, so now I know when, for example, um, one watch, I have submitted the orders, I have ended the subscription for... Um, uh, the current watch, the second I, I, I input those orders to the manufacturer, we are going into development of the, uh, of the next one immediately. Yep. Uh, because there's no way around it. There's, I mean, who knows what happens next year? I don't know with the economic you know, turnaround and all that. But uh, as things stand now, you have to be working on projects nonstop around the clock all year. Um, so that's, that's the biggest lesson that I learned thus far. Yeah, it's sort of it's sort of interesting timing making things. Do you feel a responsibility to you know those customers, those hundred and fifteen that signed up, and you know, I mean, it's sort of two months is 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 the first delay. But if there's more, like, how do you how do you kind of um, manage that? And you know, these people that took a punt on you or took a chance on you, I should say, uh, right. so early on. Uh, yes, yeah, so I do feel responsible, of course. Um, like I said, I mean, I am doing everything I can. The mm-hmm. manufacturers and the supplier suppliers are doing everything they can so i guess it's uh it really comes down to really being a good communicator and um you know just being a um uh, yeah i guess a good communicator person to person uh just saying look this is the reality of it i mean uh you can see it across the board uh each and every single brand especially the in- independent brands where your volume is so low um, and you're going up against, you know, these huge corporations and huge conglomerates that are, you know, their volumes are in the tens of thousands of uh, units. Uh, you you can't help but, uh, you know, sort of tell people like, look, I'm sorry, this is the situation. Yeah. Um, and in terms of um, my own experience with communicating that information, mm-hmm. I'm lucky to say that my collectors uh, and the and you know. The, I guess the collective around Javi Nagans thus far, uh, they're pretty understanding people. I've, I have personal relationships with about 90% of them. They know me very well. I know them very well. Um, and um, they're pretty understanding. There hasn't been too much uh, pushback, to be completely honest, because you know, at the end of the day, you know, these guys are used to waiting for you know, years on end. Um, for, they get it. Uh, my, my biggest context is, uh, FP Jorn, you know, that's where I came from. And, um, you know, you're waiting years at this point. So uh, they get it. Yeah, I mean, year for a service. So you uh, you came to us via Asha Rapkin, uh, founder of Collective mm-hmm. or co-founder of Collective Horology. Is there is there something cooking there? You mentioned your your collective. That's his collective. You guys going to be doing a limited edition. Um, is that something you um, think fits the business plan? It's, it's, it's something we've talked about. Um, I don't know when, I don't know which model, but it's definitely something we've talked about at length. And uh, look, I'm not completely opposed to, you know, doing limited editions with certain partners or strategic partners or whatever you want to call it. Um, the only limitation in that regard really is one, whether or not I like the project uh-huh. uh, and if it's in, in line with the brand's, you know, uh, standing, of course. Um it's the production timelines, you know, when, when we are sampling, for example, different dials, uh, for example, I'll give you uh, a real life example of the second one. Um, when we are going to have samples done for the dials, mm-hmm. I need to think ahead of, okay, maybe uh, this agent in Singapore or this uh, retailer in Dubai um, is going to be interested in doing a sort of uh, limited edition, then maybe I can reach out to them and say, hey, uh, we're going to start doing the sampling for the dials. Uh, would you be interested in the future? It's not, it's not obligatory, of course. It's just let's, let's see where this can head. Yep. Um, and, think, and thinking ahead, essentially, of, of what can be done because I don't have my own manufacturer, of course. So production timelines are really set when um, the aggregate orders are submitted to the manufacturers. So you know, for example, uh, if I have a hundred orders of my own uh, standard production, 
watches that I'm submitting. Uh, and then, you know, for example, X retailer in Dubai wants to do a limited edition piece set of 20. Those 20 pieces have to be included in that total order so they can get their watches on time. Sure. Um, so it's, it's just sort of this balancing act of, uh, you know, timelines and what's expected. So uh, again, effective communication really is really like the most important thing. hundred percent. So you, you're sort of talking about doing, you know, collaborations with retailers and, you know, other parties, are you moving to uh, a retailer model? Are you still going to be doing, uh, that subscription service or, you know, uh, order period for your, your second one, or are you just going to have them ready and, and drop them when they're they're good to go. What's the the business plan, I guess, for releasing the um, next one? I think it will always be a sort of hybrid model, um, to be completely honest. Now, now with the second one, uh, I'm going to do a subscription. That's that's for sure. Uh, that's that's without that's without doubt. Um, in the future, and if it goes in a very successful you know way, which it's it's looking like it's going to be a, a a good good turnout. Um, I'm going to bring on uh, strategic partners in locations that I don't have access to or I don't mm -hmm. have easy access to. So I'm in LA, I can be in, you know, domestically speaking, I can go anywhere and, and show the watches to people and, you know, do the exhibitions and all that stuff. Um, but for example, I have partnered with a prominent uh, retailer in Dubai uh, who is going to essentially represent Avi Nagan. Um, uh, all all throughout the Middle East, so they will I be see. the agent. I see Arab in the Middle East. Um, This is what this is what you're up to. Yes. This is when you, you're talking. Okay, this yes. is a limited edition. If you've, you've prepped us for it, yes. <laughs> so that's one. There's there's another um, potential partnership in uh, domestically uh, in the East Coast, and um, we just were introduced uh, through a mutual contact, and uh, we hit it off. He he understands what I'm I'm saying. He, I understand what he's saying, and. Uh, he loves the independence and love. He has. He's as passionate as I am, and um, that's another partnership. And I want to do my own limited editions too, and and yeah. sort of offer, you know, more of these as a thank you to the to the core collective nice. group of people who really support me, and um, you know, very cool dial variations. And um, I, I don't want to say too much. It's just <laughs> um, I have many, many, many ideas, and yeah, I well, want to. Yes, it's just too. executing properly. Yeah, but that'll take your time. So it sounds like you're doing a lot by yourself. Uh, obviously, you've got manufacturing partners uh, and so on. But is it is it just you in the business? It is. It so is. My wife who, helps. Um, okay. So so my wife helps out with uh, the admin side and the financial modeling because I I am horrible at that stuff. Admittedly, um, I'm more of the design and just putting people where they need to be and making sure everything's being executed properly. Um, and who's going to be your first hire? I like, then? I'm sorry, say it again. Who's going to be your first hire? I don't know. I don't know yet. Um, you don't know what role, like what would be the most, okay, I guess I'll ask that again. What would be the most valuable kind of addition to the business if you could hire, you know, one, one head count or, um, or just make, you know, everything better? That's, I, I suppose someone that can get the word out um, where I cannot. So maybe it's a copy of me, for example, just putting them Find on the yourself. ground floor and, and yeah. having them um, go around uh, spreading the word, showing the watches whenever I need them to be done. Um, to be honest, I enjoy doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the my favorite part of the job, other than the development and the creative side, is to be on the ground floor with uh, the collectors and explaining my watches and the idea of uh, the ideas that I have and um, getting feedback from them directly. Like that's, that was my favorite part of uh, where I used to work is, is just being on the ground floor and talking about the, the thing that we all love uh, really. So maybe even down the line, if, you know, um, if the company gets big enough and it gets to the point where, I just can't manage the the admin related stuff or the operational stuff. Maybe someone like that. So it could it could also be my wife. To be completely honest, yeah, um, sure. uh, she's starting to get into uh, watches. She mm -hmm. um, is she went directly past right you know the Rolex date just in the um, you know the Cartiers and went straight into loving things like M B and F um, and <laughs> you know just just straight crazy stuff. And yeah, yeah, she's <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. The, uh, the Rolex independent pipeline was accelerated. Um, 
Aaron, it's it's really been been great to chat to you and find a little bit about 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 Harvard Nagan. Uh, one thing we regularly do is we ask all our guests for a life recommendation, uh, something to you know enjoy or watch that doesn't have to do with their work. Like usually we, we've just spent the last forty minutes talking about you know Swiss supply issues and uh, watches. Sure. What have you been decompressing with? You know, watching on Netflix or reading or whatever it might be. So I'm, I'm glad you brought it. That's a, that's awesome. That's a, that is my way of decompressing and sort of disconnecting from, from the watch world. Um, I am a huge fan of this show on Netflix called Peaky Blinders. Um, and um, it's with Cillian Murphy and uh, it's sort of this gangsterish, um, you know, uh, upping, I guess the, the coming up of an individual that was born into um, you know, not so great terms and just, you know, working his way up into, into the wealth that he's amassed. So um, it's a phenomenal show. It's very well written. Um, mm. I think it's captivating. And I think I always tell people, you know, you need to check it out. So that would definitely be my, my uh, go-to. You need to check it out. Uh, Aaron, thank you so much for joining Felix and I. Hopefully we, uh, we have a chance to catch up in person sometime. Absolutely. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Well, Felix, that was a, quite an, an enlightening chat. What a lovely fella to talk to. What great dials. Dials are nice. It's sort of interesting to see where his brand ends up. I'm, I think it just sort of burst on the scene, had a lot of success as we talked about. Kind of curious to see how he follows it up and how he delivers on it, I guess, next year and what the future holds because he's pretty he's pretty passionate and pretty switched on and, you know, running a lean operation as well. So Yeah, I think LA, LA and America in general, interesting place for watchmaking at the moment. Hey, uh, thank you very much to Artem Straps uh, for your ongoing support. So consistent, mm. much support. Uh, thank you to everyone that's listened. Uh, thank you to my family. Thank you to Andy's family. <laughs> thank you to our pets. If you want to um, suggest what sort of content we should be putting in, you can email us at otthepodcast.com, Instagram ot.podcast. What else do people need to do, Andy? Yeah, make sure you leave me a five-star review. Hit us up on Spotify. Discord. Um, Discord. Join our Discord, of course. That'll be linked up. Lots of, mm. lots of fun to be had there. Share your hot takes. Feed us a little bit of content. Uh, yep. We'll farm yep. you out. Yeah, and exactly. yeah, have a uh, have a lovely day and evening and e- evening wherever wherever we found you. All right, see you guys. See you.